Well, I want to welcome everyone to the 10th birthday of CEPR. Here's our good friends, uh, Dean Baker and Mark Weisbrot. I wrote a post uh, about your 10th birthday that you had started in 1999 and how of all of the economists that I knew in Washington or, or anywhere that you guys had really consistently been there and had tremendous in intellectual integrity and had never sort of been swept away by the the, the neoliberal impulse that uh, that seemed to grip economists of our generation. So, you know, one, thank you for being here. Happy birthday. And two, you. can you tell us a little bit about how you guys started? You started out in college together, didn't you? Uh, graduate school, actually. Yeah? Where? Uh, at the University of Michigan. That's where we studied economics. Yeah? Well, that's a good, that, you're an yeah. economist, so that's a good thing. Uh, well, back then, University of Michigan had somewhat of a heterodox program. So they had, uh, you know, it was, a, it was a well respected mainstream program. I don't think it is anymore, but we ruined that. But uh, it did have uh, some heterodox economists there, which is why we went there. Many other people did. And that actually, the mainstream of the department wasn't very happy about that. Um, but. And why uh, would that be? Good question. They don't like to be challenged, and that, that's kind of long and short of it. And uh, I don't think anyone goes there these days who doesn't in fully intend to study pretty straight mainstream economics, because uh, there's no one there to work with. Really? Uh, but anyhow, yeah, so that's where we first, uh, actually we did a lot of work there on Central America, well basically uh, around Central America anti-intervention issues, because this was the height of the uh, war against Nicaragua and El Salvador, and that was where we first started working together. And then I ended up in D.C. in 92, and Mark came here, what, like four years later? I think it was that, yeah. And uh, just to jump ahead, we decided uh, that we could do, we figured we'd start out on our own and see how we'd do with our own place and not have any uh, bureaucracy over us. And how has it worked out? <laughs> the bureaucracy's all under us, so what do we care? Um, no, we've been able to do a lot. I mean, what's, I mean, the, the whole point was that we, we felt there, I mean, there are a lot of things that are going on in D.C., a lot of garbage, where we felt that we could put out useful work and we just wanted to be able to move quickly. And that was basically the idea we had in setting the place up, that we could do papers, something's in the news, we could you know, do papers quickly. We try to be careful not to say we never make a mistake, but the main thing was to, to get stuff out quickly. And that's what CEPR allows us to do, and we get a lot of stuff out. And I think we, you know, I think we've had a pretty good impact given our size. I mean, we're still, you know, on our budget, most of the, a lot of the other places around town couldn't even find an office. Well, a lot. I, my experience in sort of uh, activism and working, uh, you know, online activism, you know, is not as extensive as some other people's. But it seems to be my experience that if you are small and nimble, and you don't have layers of bureaucracy. <coughs> You can be responsive and active, and sort of get in there and hit the hit the sweet spots, you know, and don't have to sort of drag this hulking behemoth behind you. And that that is, do you consider like that to have been one of the 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 reasons for your success? Because I consider you guys really successful. Well, I think so. I mean, I think we also picked issues that were very important. Uh, we thought strategically, and that. Uh, a lot of other people would come to realize uh, were strategically important, or they didn't necessarily see it at the time that we started to work on them. And I think that helped. I mean, we had we didn't go for things that other people were already working on and taking care of. We, you know, like when we started to work on Social Security, Dean started before I did, but even you know, CEPR ten years ago, uh, hardly anybody was paying attention to it. And you know, we're lucky that. You know, some of the uh, Democratic leadership finally, you know, in 2005, when it was really under a threat of privatization, then everybody came around to our position, which was that there was really hardly anything wrong with the program uh, that needed to be fixed. And, uh, you know, when we first started to write about it, you know, uh, and Dean was writing about it, you know, before I was, uh, you know, it was all about how you couldn't really say that there was no crisis. That was the official line of a, a, a lot of the uh, Democratic leadership. Absolutely, the Democrats and, were you know, complicit in that. Al Gore had his lockbox. Al Gore did have yeah. his lockbox. They were using it. They were, they were we kind stole of, it from it. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, here was this program which is the bedrock of our welfare state, such as we have one. And um, and hardly, you know, for all those years, I mean, I think if, if people had paid attention to it earlier, we never would have gotten to the stage where a president, you know, Ronald Reagan didn't dare to go after uh, trying to find that Social Security. Why was George W. Bush even able to try it uh, in 2005? It was because for years, uh, a 
most of the people who should have been fighting to preserve the program were kind of accepting the basic uh, myths and I have to use the word lies uh, really uh, about the about social security. But we're still there. I mean, we still yeah. hear the you know social security is broken and it needs to be fixed. Yeah, no, they haven't gone away, and uh, I really worry that there'll be another push. You know, perhaps as early as next year, once you get through health care and a few other things. There I, was I, one earlier this year that sort of died under the radar, but it was yeah. it was going. No, that's right. No, that's right. And there there were people in the Obama administration who wanted to go for that. Who so, were telling David Brooks that uh, that they were going to do it imminently. Yeah, yeah. So I, I don't take anything for granted. That there. And, you know, it's, I mean, what, what, what's so, you know, getting back to the start on this with Social Security, I mean, why we were in a different position than just about everyone else was that you had these people, they go, they do everything by their focus groups. And it's just unbelievable because the focus groups are always looking at, you know, nonpartisan, you know, the median voter, people who don't have strong views. So what are you going to find by talking to people who almost by definition are not well informed on this issue? You're going to find that they're reflecting, you know, whatever gossip they heard in the paper on the news or whatever. They're not deeply formed views. But if that's the limit of what you could say, that gets you nowhere. So well, it also got popular, privatization of Social Security got popular during the, uh, the, the Wall Street uh, bubble, right? When people thought, oh, if I only had my Social Security money to gamble with, I can, I could just invest it in Yahoo and I would be rich, right? That's like when most people heard about it, wasn't it? Yeah, and that's where, I mean, this is where we really should take in a baseball bat to a lot of economists, because it's, <laughs> I, I mean, they were just saying, so we're, we're nonviolent. <laughs> yes, 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 well, we should have. No, because it, it, it was utter nonsense, and, and, you know, this is actually when I first started looking at uh, stock return numbers, because they, they were basically assuming that the stock bubble was just going to keep growing forever. And it was utterly absurd. They were making projections for stock, stock returns that were totally inconsistent with what they were assuming about the economy. And it was easy to show this. But you got all these economists who just go out and say it. Not all of them were conservatives and supporters of privati privatization by any means. But they just wouldn't take the few minutes it would take to just do the simple arithmetic. I mean, we eventually made a joke out of this during uh, the 05 uh, uh, effort, and we got Krugman to pick it up where we had the no economist left behind test. Because <laughs> it, it is just arithmetic. We just said if you think you get these stock returns, just write it down. You get stock returns from either dividends or capital gains, so just add the two numbers together. You know, you're a smart economist. You should be able to do that. You know, and, and no one could. I mean, because the point was, you know, you'd get absurd numbers. You'd have to either have corporations paying out all their dividend, all their profits as dividends, and then some. Alternatively, you'd have to have price to earnings ratios just keep rising, so they'd be three or four, five hundred to one, and no one wanted to put their name to that. <laughs> So, so, you know, they had to admit, and some of the honest uh, economists, I remember Andrew Samwick, who was uh, an economist in the Bush administration, he acknowledged that, you know. So, so you did actually get some conservative economists who said, you're right, you know, this doesn't add up. Welcome to the uh, wonderful wit and warm humor of Dean Baker that makes him beloved by uh, economists worldwide. But, but, the, but the blogosphere, definitely. <laughs> So Suzanne wants to know if uh, the CEPR that you see today is what you envisioned 10 years ago. Well, that's a good question. Um, I'm not sure what we envisioned. We envisioned maybe making it to the next year yeah. <laughs> and uh, being able to uh, pay our staff. That's always a good thing. I know I aspired to that for a long time. <laughs> but uh, it is true. I think it's bigger than what we might have expected. It's about 10 times as the uh, we budget that we started with. So I think it's uh, it's somewhat bigger. I think we probably have uh, have more influence than we thought we would have had. Um, and, uh, and I think we've about, I think we've had about the impact that we thought we could have, maybe. I don't know, what do you think? Well, in some ways, probably, you know, we, it is, you know, being in our situation in the same boat, you, you're reluctant. We never were so brazen as to write down where we expect it to be in 10 years, because I don't know what we would have put down. Because, yeah, again, you're sort of thinking, like, how are we make the budget for the next year? And, you know, if we're lucky to do that the year after. But we are doing what we expected to do. We're doing it at a much bigger scale than we were able to do back in, you know, 99, 2000, when we first got started. So I think we're, you know, if we, we'd sat down and were able to try and think realistically but optimistically, I think we're pretty much where we could have hoped to be. I mean, it's... We, we do have a pretty big footprint here now. We can cause people some pain that we wouldn't have been able to do in 99, 2000. Mm. So. Yes! <laughs> so, yeah, so I, I'd say, you know, it's an optimistic, if we were, 
prepared to actually sit down and say optimistically what we think SEPA could have looked like 10 years ago, that's probably where we are. So tell me about some of your biggest battles that you fought over the 10 years. What are the things that you sort of uh, look back and remember? Well, um, if I could take one international one, because we, we did mention Social Security, obviously. Yes, we one. did. And, you know, just one thing on that, I think that um, it also illustrates a problem that you have in general with the, with the media. You know, in the case of Social Security, it's not the media is pro-privatization or against Social Security. But what happens, and this shows you, and, and you've talked about this too, why it's, it's important to intervene early. <laughs> because uh, once, uh, you know, a whole set of journalists, editors, uh, TV reporters have said something over and over again without anybody having bothered to look at the numbers, you know, I mean, here's this program that throughout this whole period we're fighting it has been stronger than it's been and still is today, you know, uh, than in its whole uh, nearly 70-year uh, history, right? And, and, and yet here it was, you know, for years and years, they were saying that people weren't going to be able to see their benefits, you know. And so there was absolutely no empirical foundation for this. And so, but once people have said this over and over, they have find it very hard to turn around because it, it's just inertia, you know, what are they going to say? Oh, sorry, we've misreported this the last five years, ten years. You know, so the longer it goes, the more the harder it is, and that's why you still see this today, you know, it's harder to, to get people, to get the press to, to change. And, and of course, everything goes through the media. and. Uh, so, and we didn't have the blogosphere for most of this uh, period yeah. either. I think today it would have been probably easier to turn it around a little bit. Um, now, one issue I think was really strategic, we started working on the very beginning, was the IMF. IMF, I was going to say. Mark, <laughs> when Dean, why, was, uh, Dean yeah. was out of the country, but Mark was uh, yeah. Mr. IMF with us when and, we were trying to stop the supplemental. At that time, it was time we were working on nobody even knew who they were at all. I mean... They were just operating in the shadows, and here they were at that time, and now they're trying to become again, the most powerful financial institution in the entire world. I mean, not because of the money that they themselves disperse, but because they are used as a gatekeeper if you want to get money from the World Bank, the American Development Bank, the G7 governments, the Paris Club. You know, all, and sometimes even the private sector, you had, you know, the government would have to agree to IMF conditions first. So we saw that as really crucial. We said, you know, this is concentrated, completely unaccountable power. Mm -hmm. 186 uh, member countries in this organization, and it's run by the U.S. Treasury Department, mm -hmm. and they're imposing conditions on, you know, half the world, you know, hundreds of millions of people who have no real voice at all in this. And some of the times, uh, maybe even most of the time, it's disastrous. And so uh, that's why we saw that as so important. And I think we were successful. You know, and here's a good example where I think you know uh, our analysis was proven correct. You know, we said that given the unaccountability of the institution and the concentration of this power, the most important thing you could do is to try and weaken that. You know, mm -hmm. and. You can't, you know, you can try also to make the institution reform, and we're reformists, so we were in favor of that. But we didn't think that change was going to take place that way, and in fact, it didn't. What happened is the institution hardly changed at all, and, but what happened is during the last decade, it lost a huge amount of its power. And I think we definitely uh, contributed to that, because for a lot of this time, we were the only ones, uh, you know, writing about it. and and getting and uh, this ideas into the mainstream press and forcing uh, the IMF even to respond. And, uh, and they did, you know, they have done a couple of reforms, I have to say, in the last couple of years. And I do think uh, part of that is a result of this pressure. It wasn't just from us. Obviously, there have been huge demonstrations and riots against the IMF, uh, you know, in, in at least 70 countries, you know, um, for uh, going back to the mid '70s or even earlier, and uh, but they never really hit here, and, and we were lucky also that w there was a movement too at that time. First the WTO right. uh, in 1999, and then 
uh, that spread to the demonstrations against the IMF in 2000, the first ones that came to the capital, and uh, of course you had uh, their failure in the Asian financial crisis in 1998-99. And so as a result, uh, we were able to, to actually, I think, have some influence on that debate. And as you well know, <laughs> since you participated, uh, we're still having this fight to limit the damage that they do in the world. I just throw a couple of things on that. That uh, I, one of the things I think is really important about the way Mark framed it, that I think was different than a lot of others, is the main understanding of the IMF was it's a creditors cartel. It's the agent of a creditors cartel, and you have a lot of other people. I mean, sort of the popular conception that the media likes to portray is they're the international lender of last resort, and go ask Argentina about that. <laughs> you know, they're not. They're not. You know, they're not the Fed, and that was that's a really really important understanding because if you if you Think of the IMF like the Fed. I mean, I have all sorts of complaints. We have all sorts of complaints about the Fed. But I don't want to see the Fed go away. We need a central bank. The IMF is not an international central bank. They're they're basically the agent of a creditors cartel, and certainly they played that role very clearly with Argentina. That's what it was about. How can we squeeze as much money out of Argentina as possible to repay their creditors? Mm. And I don't think you could really talk about the IMF without understanding that that's their main role. It's not their only role, but it's their, that that has been their main role in the world. The other, the other point I was going to say, well, I was going to jump off and uh, throw in uh, my, uh, you know, my success story, which I, may be a surprise to people because I think it's one that I think most people know about. Actually, it was one other thing I was going to say in IMF before I get to that, that in terms of the CEPR's impact, one of the things that a lot of people probably wouldn't realize here is that a lot of our stuff gets picked up in the Latin American press, right. and it has a big impact there because it's, for better or worse, I mean, you know, probably best if they didn't listen to U.S. economists, but it's been very helpful. It's had a big impact that you have U.S. economists saying that, you know, some of the things they're doing in these countries aren't crazy. Mm -hmm. So, it, 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 and, and a lot of uh, certainly Mark's work gets picked up in papers across Latin America, and so that's a big deal. But the story I was going to say that, again, I think it's one that probably not a lot of people would know. Um, I did, did it, we've done a lot of work. I have uh, three co-authors on, at this point, probably eight or ten various permutations of papers. Uh, uh, John Schmidt, who of course is here at CEPR, uh, Andrew Glenn is a very good economist, unfortunately passed on a couple years ago, British economist, great guy, and a uh, very good economist, and, and David Hollis at the New School. And we did a, a series of papers that questioned what five years ago was absolute orthodoxy in the economics profession, that the reason Europe had high unemployment was because of the generosity of their welfare state and strong unions. And we first began to look at this. David Howe was really the one who got this project going. We first began to look at it in, I think it was 2000 or so, 2001 maybe. And we looked at the evidence that was widely cited at the time, and it was really bad work. It was just very bad economic work. And it's easy to show. It was bogus. And we wrote a number of papers, and what the real breakthrough in this was, we, uh, uh, we arranged with, uh, there's a trade union advisory committee for the, for the OECD, and the OECD was the main promulgator of this view. And they have biannual or annual meetings with the OECD where they set the agenda. And they said they wanted to have a conference devoted to discussing this. So we arranged uh, for this conference. The four of us went. We had some other economists we brought in. And we had this exchange with them. And I have to say, they're good economists, many of them. And you know, I wouldn't say like we blew them out of the water. But the point was, we got them to take the issue seriously. And we said, you know, your results are not robust. They're not compelling. And they were honest about it. So what they did was they went back and looked at the things we said, did their own work, and they basically ended up agreeing with us. Mm -hmm. So they updated their earlier analysis, and they, they very explicitly said that there's no direct link between unionization, <coughs> welfare state, and unemployment. And they made a big point of touting the Nordic model, that you have uh, Sweden, Denmark, Norway, these countries that have very low unemployment rates, very strong welfare states. And no one in the U.S. cares about that. You know, if, you, if anyone in Congress got up and said, well, the OECD tells us, you know, people would like, what are you even talking about? But in Europe, it really matters a lot. It's very common. A minister will say, the OECD is telling us we have to do X. And what the OECD was telling them 10 years ago was, you got to weaken your unions. you got to reduce your unemployment benefits. you got to pair back. They don't tell them that anymore. So that, that, I think, was a really big victory.